We're here at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. It's closed today, so they've let us have the run of the place. Secure Ninja. We're here at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, and senior curator Dag Spicer gave us a private tour. Now, he had so much interesting stuff to show us that we had to split it into two episodes, so here's part two. We're standing in the memory and storage gallery of Revolution. What we're looking at right now is one of the earliest core memories ever designed. In fact, it is the earliest core memory ever designed. It was done at MIT in 1954, 1955. Core memory was the solution to this horrible problem computer designers had, which was how to store information for the computer um, in, a, in a quick and reliable way. They tried all sorts of weird technologies, but remember this is way before RAM, DRAM right. or anything like that. They came up with core memory, which is made up of little donuts uh, through which are threaded little wires. Uh -huh. Each donut is magnetized either clockwise or counterclockwise, which corresponds to a one or a zero. And okay. so you can write to this memory uh -huh. that is store information or read information from it. And I know it looks kind of magical, but this memory was the main technology for the next 25 years oh. until, look at this one from 1978. Look how small the cores have become. Oh, okay. They're barely, you, they're like grains of pepper almost. Yeah. And uh, that's a 32K, 32 kilobyte, 16-bit uh, byte uh, memory board there. So core memory was the solution to the, to the decades-long problem of a reliable electronic high-speed memory for computers. Okay. Okay. They, it, was, uh, it transformed the whole industry. Everyone started using core memory after this. Interesting. And it just took the guys at MIT tinkering around with just lots of different little things, inventing that, and then downsizing it to that. Right. That's cool. And you remember that line from the Hollerith uh, display about uh, nothing like a crisis to, yeah. to create a solution. Uh -huh. This was a real crisis. Their machines would be, their mean time to failure was, was 10 minutes right. before the computer would crash. Right. So not acceptable. Not acceptable. Um, <laughs> you can't do any business, certainly you can't run a business yeah. off that and it's marginally useful for anything else. Absolutely. So they had to solve this memory problem and core is what solved it. Excellent. I know I like this quote too. Success has a thousand fathers. Right, and the flip side of that is failure is an orphan. Ah, <laughs> these are good. I'm going to go home with like, I'm going to be like tweeting quotes all day from the right. Computer History Museum. <laughs> Excellent. Right. The other thing is too, core memory is still used in occasional special cases, uh, for example, in, on spacecraft because it has inherent radiation hardness. That is to say, it doesn't get too upset about alpha rays or cosmic rays or gamma rays the kind of things that spacecraft are exposed to, right. it still maintains its, uh, its state. Excellent. So it is still used, believe it or not, or a variant of it, right. a little more In advanced. In situation, it's that needed. It's still used for that. Very cool. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> yeah. We're standing in front of what's called the kitchen computer, which was kind of a gag gift uh, put in the 1969 Neiman Marcus catalog uh -huh. for the housewife who had everything. Um, they had some difficulty marketing. As you can see, their main tagline was, if she can only cook as well as Honeywell can compute. Oh, that's nice. Pretty patronizing. <laughs> yes. Um, now, this computer cost $10,600 in 1969. Wow. So that's the better part of a house right. at that time. Uh, for your money, you got a two-week programming course, an apron, and you had to learn how to uh, enter and read data in Octal, which is not binary, but it's a, a base eight uh, numbering system. So it's kind of like binary, it's just as difficult right. to read pattern, you know, random patterns of lights on or off tell right. you. So it doesn't say carrots on the top, it'll say one, one, zero, oh one, one, zero, gosh, one. Then you have to look that up and see, oh, that means carrots. Oh, so no. completely impractical. Right. Um, but again, like much of their gifts, you know, they have his and her Learjets and million dollar bras and all these crazy gifts that are uh, petting zoos. Right. Uh, you can buy a petting zoo. So I'm not quite sure that a lot of them were meant to be sold. Right. But why this is important is it shows people are starting to think about computers in the home. Right. Which is kind of a new thing. You know, it has kind of a Jetsons uh -huh. uh, feel to it at the 50s, 60s, uh, sort of the, you know, the styling of this. And I yeah. think that's what the people at Neiman Marcus saw. 
And you were mentioning that there's a really significant aspect of what's inside the computer to make it work. There really is. This is based on a standard Honeywell mini computer called the 316. Okay. Its brother, called the 516, was used in a specialized computer, what we would call a router now, called the IMP, the Interface Message Processor. The IMP is what connected computers around the United States at the very beginning of the ARPANET, which became the Internet. Okay. So this computer has a, a connection to the beginnings of the Internet, cool. in a way. The same computer uh, family was right. used in a different uh, case. It, they didn't use this right. pedestal mount, they just had a square box. Okay, cool. Very good. We're standing in front of an Apple I board designed by Steve Wozniak, one of the co-founders of Apple. Wozniak was the technical brains, Jobs was the kind of marketing brains. Yes. Um, in these early days, they're still working out of a garage pretty much. Um, they did rent a space uh, near the end, but for the most part they stuffed these boards, as it's called, that is populating them with chips and soldering them, putting them together mm -hmm. uh, for people. Um, they got a big order for 50 units from a store called The Bite Shop in Mountain View, California, just near here. Right. Um, and that was their first big sale. Based on the Apple I, which was really aimed at technical people, hobbyists, people who were comfortable with a soldering iron, right. reading schematic diagrams, handling integrated circuits, those kind of things. Right. So it, it did very well. They sold 220 of them. They're now extremely rare. There's probably less than 25 in existence. Oh, wow. One of them went for almost $900,000 recently. Goodness. So they're, they've really... Um, uh, increased in value, largely after Steve's uh, demise. Right. They really went up. But the main point about the Apple One is that it proved there was something there um, in the hobbyist sphere, the, in the hobbyist world. Right. But Jobs, always kind of the more um, marketing oriented person, said, what if we could build one that normal people could use? Right. And they spent the next year designing a machine to do just that, and it was called the Apple II. Right. And that's over here which is over here. And you know, in 1985, that's a year after the Macintosh uh, product launch, uh -huh. the Apple II was still accounting for 85% of Apple's revenues. It was a huge cash cow. And many people were upset because Steve Jobs took on the, the Mac and kind of poo-pooed the Apple II as old technology. And uh -huh. yet the Apple II was the only thing keeping Apple afloat right. for almost a decade. So. It's a wonderful machine from that point of view, not only from the consumer's point of view, because it was the only one in 1977 to offer color, but it was what made Apple a successful company. Right. Okay, we're now in the networking and uh, web gallery, and we uh, are looking at the first Google server. So when Google was starting in 98, 99, they needed obviously some infrastructure. So what they did is they went to a local electronics store called Fry's, which is well known to people in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And they bought a bunch of small computers uh, in a format known as PC-104. So it's a whole PC in a f form factor about this big, maybe f six by six inches, something like that. They put four of them per shelf, and then they made about 20 <laughs> shelves. And they're all, um, it's terrible mechanical design. The only thing that is stopping this from bursting into flames is a thin layer of cork, of insulating cork, underneath all those PC-104 circuit boards. Okay. So it was quick and dirty. It got them running. Um, the networking gear that you see up here actually maps out uh, failed nodes. So if any of these PCs fails, it takes it out of the system. Okay. And so it's not burdening the system. Mm -hmm. So if you did a search in 1999 or 2000, it may have gone through this very server. Uh -huh. Oh, heck, this one, this actual one. Yeah, they had about 20 That's of them. That's all they had in 1999? They built their own. It's also really remarkable now to think about Google's scale today right. and how it could have started on something so uh, sort of thrown together and haphazard. Right. You know, they're quite the opposite of that now and as we know they need uh, to divert hydroelectric dams to power their data yeah. centers and those kind of things. Yeah. But this was just a simple uh, quick and dirty system they could build for a few thousand dollars to get them up and running. Right. Isn't this place just the coolest? A special thanks to the Computer History Museum and Dag Spicer for taking the time today to give us the tour. Make sure you make it up here to Mountain View, California to check out the museum for yourself. There's so much more here to see that we didn't even have a chance to show you today. Also, make sure you subscribe to Secure Ninja TV. Check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And as always, thanks for watching. I'm Alicia Webb. Bye.